is um, one of my members of my community asked me to um, discuss um, the um, the Senator Floor uh, Collins Cassidy Patient Freedom Act. Well, um, I'll tell you what I got here. Okay, I um, I did not actually get a chance to look at the bill proposal, and um, because I, I I just didn't have time to download it, and I had some problems getting the live stream, but I did get the actual. Um, four statements on Cassidy Collins, Patient Freedom Act. This was posted by Susan M. Collins, January 23rd, 2017. Um, let's see, how many pages is this thing? This looks like it's quite a few. Um, yeah, wow. Lots, lots and lots and lots and lots of pages. There's no way in heaven's name I'm reading 21 pages on the air. That's, that's, that's just too much. So, let me just go through, uh, and maybe the first two or three pages, and then we'll see what we can... I'm, gonna, I'm just going to get to the main meat. Um, she said here, Mr. President, there has been much debate recently on the best approach to replacing and reforming the Affordable Care Act. Considerable confusion and anxiety exists about the current status of the law and the future of health care in America. What is often overlooked in the discussion, however, is that the Affordable Care Act provides a valuable assistance for some people who were previously uninsured. The system created by the law is under tremendous financial stress. The Obamacare exchanges are on the verge of collapse in many states. The reality is that significant changes must be made. Doing nothing is not an option. This is pretty much just like Donald Trump had said. Same thing. The Affordable Care Act has been in effect for years, yet nearly 30 million people still do not have health insurance coverage. Many of those who do have coverage through the Affordable Care Exchanges are experiencing large spikes in premiums, deductibles, and co-pays, increasing costs to consumers and taxpayers alike. Contrary to predictions made by early supporters of the Affordable Care Act, premiums are increasing in nearly every state, with the average increase at 25% nationally. The situation is even more dire in some states like Arizona, where premiums have increased by 116%. In many counties in Arizona, there's only one health insurer offering plans on the exchange, severely limiting consumer choice. In fact, in uh, for a time last summer, there was no insurer willing to offer exchange coverage in Pinal County. Fortunately, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona reversed its decision to exit the exchange in this county, but had the insurer not done so, it would have presented an even bigger problem for the county's ACA participants. Nearly 90% of those enrolled were eligible for premium tax credits. How, but subsidies are only available for plans sold on the exchange, meaning that these individuals and families would have had to shoulder the full burden of their expensive health insurance coverage if no insurer participated in, in the Affordable Care Exchange. In my state of Maine, Premiums for the individual market for 2017 have soared 22% on average, and plan absence have become more limited. While subsidies cushion the blow for them, consumers who are eligible for them, others have had to shoulder the full increase, and of course, taxpayers had to bear a greater burden. Moreover, um, individuals and families with incomes of exceeding 250% of the poverty rate are not shielded from the dramatic increases in deductibles and co -pays. Many with coverage on the Affordable Care Act are also increasingly facing narrow networks, which means they may find their preferred doctors not in, that, in their networks. This can be particularly difficult in the rural states that may have very sp few specialists and whose citizens rely on major medical centers in nearby states. If patients 
want to continue to see these doctors, they can be faced with enormous costs that are not covered by the insurance. As one Mainer put it, quote, President Obama said I could keep my doctor, and the insurance company says I cannot. The co-ops created on the Affordable Care Act to help provide health insurance coverage are also failing at alarming rates. In fact, only five out of 23 remain operational. Last year, the financial standing of the main co-op was much, well, it was such that, but the ACA, it would have been placed in receivership under the state law. It is also important to carefully consider the effects that Obamacare, Obamacare's Medicare cuts have had on providers like rural hospitals and home health agencies, many of whom are struggling. In some, prices are skyrocketing, coverage is narrowing, and the individual market is likely a death spiral if Congress does not act. Now, that's pretty much what I've seen myself. Um, the Affordable Care Act is no longer affordable, like Donald Trump said. He's correct. It's no longer affordable. Um, now, she, I don't know if she... I didn't go very far on this yet, so I, I'm, I was reading this here. Um, okay. Um, I saw some of this, uh, our discussion of a similar topic on, um, on right side broadcasting. There was a filler, there was some filler footage from the Senate, um, on before Donald Trump was to, uh, sign some bills. And, um, one of the people mentioned something about the state system. I want to talk about that because, um, I think it ties in with this. Is it better to have the states control and regulate their own health care, or is it better to have the federal government? Um, well, one of the things that was stated by both a medical doctor and by uh, some of the people in the Senate, which were questioning him, was in some states... Um, there's not enough money to cover for all the bills, expenses, and, of course, requirements that the Affordable Care Act was supposed to provide for, including things like prenatal coverage. Now, prenatal is important because, you know, after all, you want to have a healthy baby and you want to have, um, you know, a healthy family. That's, that's important. You want, to make sure, you want to make sure that the mother's needs are provided for. On the original Affordable Care Act, as originally was written, prenatal was not in there. That was added later on, as, as because it was felt that there was enough call for it. One person said, in some states, the costs associated with medical expenses has gotten so high that the state's budgets can't afford it either. Connecticut is a disaster, and now I, I'm, I'm surprised that no one ever really talked about Connecticut. This was a was a major Midwest state that was was um, Senator was talking about this. Connecticut. I'm not talking about my state. I live here. It's an expensive state, right? And I mentioned to some people about the rehabilitation services for the blind in Connecticut. I'm gonna. And this is what I'm gonna talk about. Go covers the whole state, not just that. Governor Daniel P. Malloy cannot seem to get the state legislature to come up with a budget that that works for everybody. Part of the reason is the unions, such as the service employees. Or S E I U, Service Employees International Union, the SEIU, has dragged the states through the ringer. Has uh, some other unions demanding um, union wage, union concessions, and other things, and pensions, and it's it's killing the state. For a long time, states like Connecticut depended on tax revenue from corporate taxes to help finance these programs. Businesses, of course, are looking for a lower price place to work and to their operations. So Connecticut is just not it. Connecticut got too expensive. So we lost General Electric. We lost UPS. Um, we lost. We now we lost a major pharmaceutical group in Connecticut. And the tax, the corporate taxes, are not there to pay for all of the services that are being pushed. Um, 
So the state of Connecticut um, started going and saying, "Is well, how are we going to get money, especially using the Suen's um, Collins Bill, which is an example here. Um, I only read part of what she says here, but she's right on everything so far. Um, Connecticut used to be the insurance capital of the world. Used to be. Past tense. Um, today, many of the major insurance companies are leaving Connecticut because they can't afford to stay here anymore either. Remember the corporate tax thing. Okay, that's a good problem. If corporate taxes keep going up, the businesses are going to leave. Um, the state of Connecticut, because of all that, has had to cut back on Medicare or Medicaid programs. I'm on a spend down for $2,500. That's what i got to pay out of pocket before I can get any Medicaid back. i got to pay outrageously expensive copays just to do routine checkups at the doctor. Because I have on a spend down, Medicaid will not pay for my eyeglasses. They will not pay to fix my teeth. Never mind all the jokes in my teeth being crooked. I know they're crooked. <laughs> That's obvious. Um, and the rehabilitation services programs that would be, um, would have been there to assist the handicapped and those who need retraining are gone. They're not there either because the, the state budget is not providing the funding and resources for those programs. Um, so if, according to what I have read about the Susan Collins bill, was to take place, the state of Connecticut would have to find a way to um, get... Um, corporations back in. The idea was, is let's finance it through by paying taxes or have, having the rich upper 1% pay with taxes. Yeah, but the 1% tax people are the ones who are most mobile and they can move anywhere they want, even out of the country. It's not the one percenters that are getting hurt here. It's the 99 percenters, uh, the majority of us, who have either A, are in fixed incomes, but we still have to pay these ridiculous copays, or premiums, or even the middle class. With jobs disappearing in the state of Connecticut very quickly, um, there's no way you can expect that those people are going to be able to continue. Now, let me see if I can wrap this up here. Um, let's see. The Patient Freedom Act is built on the premise that giving people more choice to us is superior to the one size fit all approach that defined Obamacare. We recognize what works best for the people of Maine or New Hampshire might not be the right for the people of Louisiana or California. Our bill respects these differences by giving states three options to choose the path that best works for their citizens. Option one would allow a state to choose to continue operating its insurance markets pursuant to all the rules of the Affordable Care Act. If the state chooses to remain covered by the ACA, exchange policies will continue to be able to um, yeah, exchange policies will continue to be eligible for cost-sharing subsidies and advanced premium tax credits, and the state's insurance market will st still be subject to the ACA requirements. The individual mandate and the employee mandate will still remain in place in that state. Medicaid expansion states will continue to receive federal funding. More appealing to many states, however, would be the better choice option in the Patient Freedom Act that would allow a state to waive many of the requirements of the Affordable Care Act except for vital consumer protections and still receive federal funding to help its residents purchase affordable health insurance. Here's how it would work. Individual, eligible individuals in states seeking this option would receive federal funding deposited into their Roth health savings accounts. The aggregate funding for these per beneficiary deposits would be determined based on the total amount of funding that the federal government would have provided um, in the form of the Affordable Care Act subsidies in each state plus any funding each state would have received had it chosen to expand its Medicaid program, even 
If, like the state of Maine, it had chosen not to dish out, this deposit would be phased out for higher income benef beneficiaries. For every resident who does not have health insurance coverage through his or her employer or through public programs like Medicare and Medicaid, states selecting this option would be required to offer a standard health insurance plan that would include first dollar coverage through the Roth Health Savings Account basic prescription drug coverage, and a high-deductible health plan. Uh, states could automatically enroll eligible residents into the standard plan in order to help ensure health coverage access unless an individual opted to use his or her HSA to purchase more comprehensive coverage or opted out of coverage altogether. Individuals who are insured under the Patient Freedom Act would receive debit cards tied to their Roth HSAs, which they would then use to purchase a standard health plan and pay directly for medical expenses. Alternatively, they can choose the funds to pay premiums for a more generous health care policy. In addition to federal funds, individuals and employers can make um, contributions to these health savings accounts and balances would be tax-free. This bill would also provide for a partial tax credit for very low-income individuals who do receive employer-based coverage to to help them workers pay their deductible co-pays. Health care providers recent this is getting really long. Health care providers <laughs> receiving payments from the Roth HSAs would be required to publish cash prices for their services, which would add transparency that would need to move forward a more patient directed health care future. Under the third option, states could choose to design and regulate their own health insurance markets free from most of the requirements of the Title I of the Affordable Care Act without any federal assistance. All right, now, I have a couple questions. Here we go. People on low income, many of them do not pay taxes. Many of them, especially the disabled, are not paying taxes because we make well below what is required to file even a 1040A tax return. So how in the hell are we going to get a kind of deductible? Even if you're working a job, say a, a minimum wage job, your 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 um, your special kind of tax break or tax credit would not be huge by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, option three seems to be pretty popular. One states that have more resources available to them. Connecticut would not be that one state. Connecticut would be definitely more choosing option one, maybe option two, but option three, Connecticut would never happen. Connecticut state legislature has no funds for that. Um, now, let's talk about the let's talk about the individuals' requirements. Uh, what what it like he says in option two, the states will provide kind of a standard plan. But you can choose not to have that same plan. You can choose to go with your own plan. Well, that's kind of a compromise. Because you kind of got that option. You can choose something from the state of Connecticut, say like the Husky program. Um, but then you can, for, for children, that's just it. Husky's for children. It's not for, for adults. Um, I know there's also Conpace. That's for the um, for elderly Um but yet, again, these are all of these programs are not going to help average everybody. Okay. Now, the first, let's talk about one of the biggest issues: high deductibles. Even under the bronze plan of the Affordable Care Act and Connecticut Exchange, I looked. I could not get any coverage any better than what I got right now, in Medicaid. It's actually the same. Be shit. Okay. Except it does have support for some doctor visits, such as the dentist and the um, uh, eye doctor and the hearing specialist. But the problem is, is when you add in the deductible cost, $2,500, and the, the, uh, the patient's copay to go see these doctors is like $50 to $100. Um, if you're on a fixed income, no, that's not going to work. Uh, you're going to be... Realizing that your one day's worth of wages, if you're lucky, you may actually just about cover your one visit to the doctor. 
in some cases, it might only be two days worth of wages. So, that's that's not going to work. The next thing we need to do is, if you wanted to work with this one, it sounds like it's doable for some states, is how about this? How about asking the doctors? Yes, I agree. Put your list of expenses up front on your, you know, like like when you go ahead and you buy something at McDonald's. Here you have a list of, of prices on the menu. You can see, for example, a mammogram, say, it's about uh, $100 for a basic screening. Um, uh, uh, thyroid follow-ups is, say, $50, you know. Specialized esoteric blood tests could be listed on my price so you know, for example, you could tell your doctor, okay, I can afford to do the basic screening for mammogram. I can afford to um, maybe go ahead do my thyroid check this month, but I can't afford to um, pay for vitamin D testing right now. I'm sure that will drive my doctor apeshit because he knows that when my health, my health is a crazy mess. Um, my health is a giant enigma. Anybody who ever seen my health would know that. But the problem is, is the doctors themselves are in some ways kind of lobbied by the pharmaceutical industry. Um, they get a lot of kickbacks if they prescribe certain medications made by certain pharmaceutical companies. That companies are going to be charging more money for those drugs that they're recommending that the doctors push to the patients. So it doesn't matter if you like it or not. It, the reality is, it's just really, really um, problematically expensive. So I'm not saying we want to go back and choose to say option three, which is basically is the states do everything that's fine to a point in states that can afford it. But um, the issue I have with this whole business is where, when do the doctors themselves um, make changements on their own plan billing rates? When can a doctor themselves say to their so-called uh, pharmaceutical lobby, Okay, look, I'm not going to go ahead and prescribe you medication that costs my, you know, me, um, you know, my patients say $500 a bottle. That's ridiculous. Um, I got to go ahead, we're going to use the generics. I want to provide basic health care. I want to provide the basic needs. I'm not going to sit there and, and uh, you know, try to fleece my patients all this money because you want me to to prescribe the higher tier drugs and do high and, and do as unessential uh, unrequired testing because there's also the issue of tort reform i mentioned this a lot so let's go through that doctors do a lot of preventive medicine what that means is they'll run extra tests just to prove that their diagnosis is right if they don't and the patient gets sick then the tort the tort lawyers love it because then they can say malpractice then doctors have to pay high malpractice insurance and that's where you got the issue it's not just well how are we going to provide john doe in connecticut with an affordable health care plan the problem is is what about what about jeff you know, Jeff Smith, medical doctor. How are we going to help him to keep his insurance premiums within reason? We always seem to say it's always, you know, blame the doctors and say that the doctors are always the most expensive thing and then they're fleecing you because they can and that's why it's always lucrative money to become doctors. If that was true, doctors would not be leaving the field. It's a hard job as it is, being a doctor and having to know all these diagnoses and all these tests and, and crushing caseloads and, and insurance um, providers that, you know, have certain requirements that they throw in the doctors too. And then the doctors get stuck having to run all these preventive maintenance, um, you know, preventive tests just to make sure that their diagnosis that you got a hangnail is correct, if that's what you had, right? Instead, it would be better if the doctor could say very firmly, um, look, I've seen hangnail before. I know what a hangnail is. I don't need to run a blood test to tell the person's got a secondary infection caused by a hangnail. 
I already know I can see that the fingers are swollen, so that I know that there's something wrong. Now, why would I have to go through and, and, and run 15 zillion tests when I already know that the hangnail with a secondary infection? That's the whole point. So, I, I appreciate that she said, well, I'm going to provide three choices. Um... But the state of Connecticut cannot afford to go with option two, and it certainly cannot afford to go with option three. And neither can the state of California. Um, Texas, maybe. Texas is doing good. Texas has got a lot of business. Texas is growing um, very actively. But for some people in some states, it just may not work out well at all. Now, the idea of a high deductible standard plan is not going to help somebody who gets in, say, really sick, maybe develops a liver condition or cancer or has, um, they have an abscess in a tooth or, um, you know, they got a severe cataract condition with their eyes. They are the ones who are going to go, I can't pay for the, go afford to go to an ophthalmologist to fix a cataract. I can't afford to go get my tooth fixed at a dentist. I can't afford to because they want too much money up front. Um, so it's a complicated problem that is not going to be resolved just because you say it's going to be affordable. It's not.